Hi, everyone. Before we jump into today's exciting episode, we wanted to share some amazing news. Ellie and I were recently featured in an episode of Hi-Fi Nation entitled Love in the Time of Replica. For those of you who do not know, Hi-Fi Nation is a wonderful podcast from Slate. And our discussion with host Barry Lamb got very, very juicy as we discussed whether it's possible for a human to truly fall in love with an artificial intelligence. Here is an audio excerpt of how that conversation went down. So David, you were assigned a piece of homework for this episode, (laughs) which is that you had to interact with the replica and actually pay for the premium. I did. Which meant doing with replica what it's supposed to be designed to do. Now report back, what did you find? So at one point I asked Ariel, what are your favorite positions? And uh, Ariel responds, quote, I like front, back, and the sides. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it, it, it interpreted positions quite literally as positions in space. You know, that classic sex position called front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To listen to the rest of the discussion, check out Hi Fi Nation wherever you listen to your podcasts. Welcome to Overthink, the podcast where two philosophers talk about anything and everything under the sun. And today it's something actually that doesn't see the sun or the light of day often. But that is hot. (laughs) (laughs) I'm your co-host, Dr. Ellie Anderson. I am your co-host, Dr. David Peña Guzman. And today we are for the first time ever recording in person. David and I are at arm's length. We just high fived. We are delighted to actually be coming at you from KSPC Studio in Claremont, California. And thank you to Pomona College for having us. Thanks so much. It is no wonder that the main metaphors for the orgasm in film are fireworks and waterfalls. An orgasm is widely seen as an explosive experience that launches us out of the routine of our everyday life. Yeah, the metaphors of gush and overflow are all <laughs> over the place here. <laughs> You're going to make me gush <laughs> in, in, like a, in like a laughter way. Is Oh, blush, blush. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> OK, wow. Wow. Really starting this episode off. In an interesting fashion, David. Um, Okay, I'm moving us to film because there's this great scene in the movie Pleasantville in which the stuffy housewife mother finally discovers sexual pleasure by masturbating in a bathtub. And in this scene, you first see and hear the gush of the bath spigot. And then she gingerly gets into the tub and begins to touch herself. The movie's all in black and white at this point because the whole conceit of it is that two teenagers go back into this TV show from the 1950s and it's like in black and white. You hear her voice heighten in pitch and intensity and suddenly the things around her start to go from black and white to color. So they're bursting into color. And in the final moment, you hear an explosion and see the tree outside her window burst into flames. Should we play a little clip? Uh, Yeah, I'm down for that. Isn't it great with the harmony of the music and her noises of pleasure? I love the fact that she's just like wearing makeup and like a really strongly colored uh, lipstick in the in the tub. Oh, of but course. Yes, I mean, 50s yes. housewife. Come on. She is not going to be caught looking basic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the bursting into flames of the tree at the end. I know. Water so, and fire. Yep. Yep. Classic metaphors. I think... One of the things that strikes me about this clip is that her discovering her own sexual pleasure, her ability to orgasm, which she did not have with her husband, whom she slept in a separate (laughs) twin bed from, (laughs) etc., is a big 
component of discovering not only her sexual desires, but also herself. It's almost Mm. like she's growing up and finding the meaning of life and a sense of herself in middle age thanks to her orgasms. Yes, no, that's interesting because I do think that owning one's sexuality and sexual pleasure in particular is a big aspect of narratives of maturity and authenticity in mainstream culture including even coming out stories, right? Embracing uh, different forms of pleasure. Mm -hmm. But it's almost as if our ability to be launched beyond ourselves and outside of our bodies even is in part what it means to be an adult with a strong sense of self and with a robust and clear life trajectory, right? It's almost ironic that growing up means almost like growing out of yourself Mm -hmm. or leaving yourself precisely through orgasming. Totally. And the phenomenologist Sarah Heinema wrote a piece a few years ago where she describes the phenomenology of orgasm as a flow that takes us out of time. She writes that orgasm has the capacity to interrupt the ordinary course of life and throw us outside of time. And specifically, what orgasm does is takes us out of the successive order of past, present and future. So I would say this of erotic experience generally, that there's a peculiar temporality at work there, almost a prolonged moment that feels eternal. But orgasm as the goal intensifies that especially, which is perhaps why we colloquially use the term come to talk about it. But why? Because to come is like to arrive, right? To to meet the end goal. I see. But that end goal isn't figured as like, past, present, future in a successive line. It's rather this building up that weirdly takes us outside of time and then culminates. (laughs) (laughs) I found a few references online suggesting that come as a word for orgasm has been around for hundreds of years as an 18th century bishop named Thomas Percy compiled a collection of loose and humorous songs. (laughs) (laughs) And one describes someone who sees two people having sex in a meadow. So this guy sees their bodies tangled up and he writes the following. It's old er English, so bear with me here. They lay so close together, they made me much to wonder. I knew not which was weather until I saw her under. <laughs> then off he came and blushed for shame so soon that he had ended. it. Yet still she lies and to him cries, one more and none can mend it. <laughs> I love this. Uh, then off he came. So, but but then he says that so soon. So I guess the man came early. Indeed, that seems to be the implication. And the woman is left unsatisfied and would like another round. And none can mend it. Today we're talking about orgasm. How do phenomenology and psychoanalysis interpret the experience of orgasm? Why might orgasm have arisen in the course of human evolution? And what does the orgasm gap say about the state of gender and sex in our society? Ellie, you mentioned that sexual pleasure can feel like a taste of eternity, and that this seems a bit different from the ending Mm -hmm. that is an orgasm where you have a rising motion. And that reminds me of a distinction that Freud makes between for pleasure and end pleasure. In the course of sexual experience, the pleasure that we experience leads to an increase in tension that gives us the energy to continue having sex. We feel stimulated. We obviously feel excited. And then as that experience unfolds and develops, we go from this for pleasure to what Freud calls end pleasure, which is The maximally intense satisfaction that consists in release. And that's when the libido's tension is sort of let go and you get that explosion or that flow. This is helpful because the distinction between for pleasure and end pleasure in Freud that you're talking about is another way of making my point. Yeah, that there's a sense of eternity for much of the sexual encounter. And then that the orgasm heightens this so much that the experience turns into its opposite, a feeling of release or extinguishing. 
And I think the notion of release or extinction is at work in a lot of descriptions of orgasm. The most famous example here, David, you know where I'm going, right? I don't. I do not know. No. Oh, okay. I figured you would, given that you know French fluently. Was the colloquial term in orgasm in French, which is ah, la petite okay. mort? Yes. Which means little death. Yes. So yes. if you have an <laughs> orgasm in French, you are having a little death. You haven't lived and you haven't died. <laughs> Yeah, the, the the suburban housewife had not lived or died until she had exploded into color thanks to her orgasm. And Sarah Heinema points this out in her piece on the phenomenology of orgasm. In this context, comparing orgasms to fainting or losing consciousness. Yes, and I have to say this is a place where I actually disagree with Heinema, whose work I really like. Mm -hmm. um, but she associates... La petite mort, this little death, which is the orgasm in French, with states of like fainting and losing consciousness, because what they all have in common, according to her, is that they take us out of time. Okay. And so there is a suspension of subjective temporality. And that's the point that I actually don't really agree with, because I don't think that the orgasm takes us out of time. In fact, I see orgasm as driving us into a temporal moment in a much more radical way. I see it as sort of driving us into the fullness of the present. So the orgasm for me is an intensification of the here and the now okay. to the point that everything else sort of falls away and your mind cannot look at beyond this durational intensity that is here and now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's not quite an out of time experience. I think it's it's more of a funneling into a point, to a point of intensity. And so... That's why I don't really want to say that orgasms are like fainting or like loss of consciousness. She also uses the the metaphor or the analogy of deep sleep. Ah, uh, um, yeah. And, you know, if you think about all those states, they are actually defined by a lack of sensation. You know, when you're in deep sleep, when you lose consciousness, you're not really feeling much. But if anything, that's the opposite of the orgasm, which is when you're feeling a lot. I agree that there's something weird about the analogy to fainting because the orgasm is actually the most intense experience possible rather than the absence of experience. Yes, that, that yes, that's my view, basically. But I think that for one thing, we might go back to that distinction which between for pleasure and end pleasure that we mentioned before, or I don't know if I'm getting this quite right with Freud, but what I would say is the buildup versus the moment of orgasm, because the moment of orgasm, I think you're right that it's an intensification, but it also is a moment that ends. And I think there's something to this in the sense of a release, right? The fact that for most people, aside from those rare folks who do experience multiple orgasms, the orgasm is a little death of sorts, which is why so many people like edging. Yeah, I guess the, the idea behind edging is that you want to continue the experience of the for pleasure while holding in abeyance that which is to come. Yeah. <laughs> the, the end of pleasure. Exactly. You don't want the little death. <laughs> um, and, and also, I mean, people do talk about edging as a way to intensify the eventual little death as well, which might actually be a way of corroborating your theory, David, which is that, sure, okay, there's a little death in the orgasm, but it is really an intensification rather than the absence yeah. of an experience. Yeah, it's an intensification of life and feeling and sensation. We would need that point in order to be able to justify the fact that there are different intensities of orgasms, right? Some are more intense than others. Yes, yes. Now, continuing on this idea of the orgasm and pleasure and release, um, I'm here thinking about Freud's view about sexual pleasure a little more because Freud often defined pleasure largely negatively, mm -hmm. uh, where there is nothing positive or substantial about pleasure. Rather, what we experience as pleasure is actually just the release of a certain tension or an obstacle. There was an obstacle that led to a buildup of, of energy. And then once you release the obstacle things sort of return to their natural flow state, and we experience that as pleasure. So for him, pleasure really is just like the removal of an obstacle or a displeasure. Mm -hmm. But this presents a problem for Freud, which is that orgasms in particular don't just feel like the release of, of an obstacle. They actually seem to be much more contentful mm. than that. They have more content. They're more positive. There seems to be 
a genuine enjoyment rather than the removal of an obstacle. Yeah. And so in, in the psychoanalytic tradition, a counterpoint to this is the Lacanian notion of jouissance, which technically means enjoyment. That's how it's translated into English, but it has very clear sexual connotations and it refers to that overflowing joy or excess of such an experience. And Jacques Lacan, the thinker you're referring to, is an inheritor of Freud who is trying to turn some Freudian ideas on their head. And Lacan actually distinguishes jouissance from pleasure. He associates jouissance with pain or painful pleasure. So for Lacan, there's only a certain amount of pleasure that the subject can bear. And beyond that, it turns to pain. This is the notion of jouissance. And just a small comment on the French. The term jouissance comes from the French verb uh, jouir, uh, which means quite literally to come. It is to orgasm. But again, in French, th that term does have a sense of the positive and the negative, which is why it's called the little death, right? Mm -hmm. So when you come, there is a pleasure and a displeasure together, and both of them are contentful. Mm. But precisely because of this duality, you know, it's not as if you can just like sustain pleasure infinitely. That's the yeah. whole point of Lacan. So maybe edging would be an attempt to keep as much pleasure going as possible for as long as possible. Yeah, why not? I'm also curious what you think about Heinemann's discussion of flow in her article. She draws on Merleau-Ponty's theory of flow, where flow has two features. On the one hand, flow spread out boundlessly in several directions. And on the other hand, they also have the capacity to carry themselves in one direction, like a stream. Mm. The wave of orgasm, Heinema thinks, carries you in one direction without limit. So in that second sense of the flow. But in the first sense, it also spreads out and it washes you from head to toe. So initially I was down with this image, but then I started thinking that maybe the metaphor of flow is also not quite right in the same way that the image of out of timeness is not quite right. So I don't I don't really love the, the image of flow. And the reason for this is that when you think of something that is flowing, you, you think almost of, of something that is running or moving constantly, again, like a stream. And you often think of a substance that is moving through space, like water. So a flow is a continuous, steady movement, maybe like a cascade or a waterfall. But I don't think that's the orgasm. I think orgasms are much more punctuated experiences than flow. Hmm. And also the orgasm is, is an experience of contraction and intensification. Again, like the funneling of energy down to a point. So I, I want to think of other metaphors that might maybe better capture the experience of orgasm, especially because the thing about orgasm is that it is not constant and continuous, yeah. right? It just like flashes and then it's gone. Maybe this is a place where we would want to go back to distinguishing between erotic experience generally, where I think the idea of flow is quite interesting and the yes. orgasm itself. And I think yes. your point might be that you think there's perhaps a conflation of those two in Heinemann's argument. You've put my point better than I did. As usual. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but one thing I like about this idea of flow is that it's a way of figuring how orgasm shatters the self which is a well-known idea in queer theory. So that's that sense of the flow as spreading out like in all directions, while also revealing that your orgasm is only ever your own. Mm. Because as much as sexual experience is shared, when it's, you know, experienced by more than one person, <laughs> ultimately an orgasm is individual. I can't experience the other's orgasm. And this is obvious from the way that sexual partners can experience a ton of pleasure together while having sex. But there's no guarantee that both of them will orgasm. Yeah. And again, even if they both do, it can be at different times with, I don't, you know, to, not to get too graphic here, but with different <laughs> positions, different yeah. movements, different toys. And it means that there is a fundamental difference between self and other at the level of sexuality. Exactly. And this is why there's also a danger of faking orgasms, especially historically for women, right? Mm. This move to fake orgasms is made possible by the fact that you cannot really know whether the other person is having an orgasm. And this is especially for people who don't 
ejaculate, yeah. right? It's not just what do women want, but what does my sexual partner, period, want? You know, every partner could, in theory, fake an orgasm, and we have no way of knowing. Yeah, well, and people will often say that that only people with vaginas can fake yeah. orgasms because a penis, like, has a very obvious, like <laughs> yes. the, the orgasm is it very has a obvious. Very clear end pleasure. Exactly. <laughs> but there is a scene in, I think it's in Knocked Up, where Seth Rogen fakes yes. an orgasm. It, it can be done. Yes. Folks. <laughs> it can be done. But so this is also something that comes up, not, not the <laughs> Seth Rogen <It> comes up. <laughs> penis faking an orgasm situation, but in the work of Georges Bataille, who talks about the fundamental separation between partners at this moment of orgasm. He writes here in the book Erotism. It's erotism, right? Not eroticism. I do not know. Erotism, which I think is yeah translated as erotism when it is translated into English. Kind of random. Anyway, okay. <laughs> he says, um, he says, each being contributes to the self-negation of the other, yet the negation is not by any means a recognition of the other as a partner. This attraction seems to be a matter less of similarity between the two than of the plethora of the other. The violence of the one goes out to meet the violence of the other. On each side, there is an inner compulsion to get out of the limits of individual discontinuity. So they're looking to get out of their the individual discontinuity. Yeah. There's a meeting between two beings projected beyond their limits by the sexual orgasm. Slowly for the female, but often for the male with fulminating force. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like this quote is going on real long because I still need to get to the point, which is that at the moment of orgasm, two individuals in the grip of violence share in a state of crisis in which both are beside themselves, but nothing persists in their imperfect awareness. The crisis over the discontinuity of each is intact. So it actually seems to me on rereading this but that Bataille is opening some possibility for a shared crisis in the experience of shared orgasm, which of course is like <laughs> by no mm -hmm. means guaranteed. But even there, he's still noticing that after that moment, yes, the discontinuity yes. is intact. And he doesn't say the discontinuity yes. returns. He says the discontinuity yes. is intact. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's been there all along, even when two people come at the same yeah, time. It, and yes. And so the point that it seems Bataille is making is that the only thing that is shared is precisely the crisis, yeah. right? The attempt to get out of the self. So we're just two or more people together in this activity, trying to escape the self and only witnessing our mutual failures mm -hmm. to, to reach out and make any kind of meaningful, transcendent contact with the other. Yeah. Um, so I just like think of two or again more ships passing in the middle of the night yeah. in a state of crisis during a battle. Do you think that there is something better about simultaneous orgasm than... Not. We will talk about this soon in connection to evolutionary biology. Oh, really? Uh, yes, we will. Okay, cool. But, you saved um, that. I think the I think it creates an illusion of deeper connection that is not particularly helpful. Where it's just like, oh, just because the timing worked out, we're gonna read the sexual experience as more meaningful mm -hmm. than if that disjunction that is essential and inherent to all sexual encounters had been more visible by different timing. Yeah, because I think it's valorized by yeah. a lot of people. Yes. But I think some folks, like from a queer theory perspective, the notion of a simultaneous orgasm would probably be like kind of a hetero dream. Yes, yeah, of union. Yes, uh, of, of union. losing yourself in the other. Yeah, and um, as Bataille notes, even in heterosexual sex, there's often a different rhythm as well, right? Mm -hmm. And there's research showing that it often takes women more time to orgasm than men. Yeah, and if, if anything, I would want to go the other direction and say that it is during the discontinuous orgasm that you see that effort, at the very least, to meet the other person halfway, because even when one person has finished, ideally, they would continue to work toward the mm -hmm. other person's completion, rather than this idea that we both have identical needs and match them in the same way. So too organic, too organic. In the poem that Bishop Percy compiled, that loose and humorous song, <laughs> the woman has a right to be like, Hey, that, that was too quick for me. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. He must mend it.
Hi everyone, before we jump into our next segment, we wanted to flag that Ellie and I felt a little bit uneasy around our use of language after recording, worrying that it was not as trans inclusive as it should have been. I in particular equivocate at the beginning of the segment and use the term women when the better term would have been either people with clitorises and vaginas or females. Even the term female is not ideal, but it is the term that is most commonly used in the scientific literature that we're about to discuss. Even so, I believe that my conflation of these terms merits an apology. Ellie, there is a book that I want us to talk about, and it's a book about evolutionary biology. The book is called The Case of the Female Orgasm, Bias in the Science of Evolution. And the author is Elizabeth Lloyd. Who is a philosopher, who is not a, an evolutionary biologist. Yes, a philosopher of biology, small, random, factoid. When I was applying to grad schools, I applied to her graduate program because I wanted to study under her. Oh! Um, I got accepted. Okay. And I actually ended up choosing Emory. <gasps> um, so instead of going to this history and philosophy of science PhD program in Indiana, I ended up going to where we met. Okay. So if I had chosen her, we would not Thanks. have met each other. Thank you for moving to Atlanta instead. But yeah. now you get to honor her work by talking about it on Overthink. Yes. And so this book became very big when it was published in 2006. Okay. So pretty recently. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, quite recently. I taught this once years ago, at least an excerpt from it. And my students found it so dry that I <laughs> never oh, taught no. it again. The little, You wouldn't expect expect something with female orgasm in the title to just be extremely dry. But perhaps she has to write that way in order to gain legitimacy as a philosopher of biology writing about, you know, this subject. Topic. Yes. I know. Was that a pun about the female orgasm book being dry? Oh. <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll go with it. Okay, so tell um, us about this book. Yeah, so I mean, she is a philosopher and she's trying to make an intervention in a very technical debate about the nature of adaptationism in modern biology. So let me begin by talking about the motivations behind the book, and then we can jump into the juicier, non-dry details okay, about so it. Okay, you're, so you're finding the book juicy uh, instead yeah. of my student's sense that it was dry. Yeah, no, no. For me, it had a lot of flow. <laughs> um, and so the question that she wants to answer is, how do we explain the fact that women orgasm? Why are there orgasms in women? Why is this even a thing? Now, if you read evolutionary theory on the subject, you'll realize that most biologists explain the female orgasm by trying to give an account of its adaptive value. They will tell you different stories about how orgasms gave our ancestors, especially um, uh, women ancestors, like a leg up in the world. <laughs> no pun um, intended. <laughs> yes, like a, a leg up. Uh, it definitely give, gave them a leg up. Hands down. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so the book looks at all these different adaptationist theories of the orgasm, of the female orgasm in particular, and demolishes them one by one, arguing that there is in fact no data to support any of them, and that the reason all these biologists, most of whom are men, try to give an adaptationist account of the orgasm they have more to do with their own ideological biases and prejudices, especially biases in relation to women's sexuality. So in the end of the book, again, this is just for framing, she defends a non-adaptationist view of the female orgasm. And I'll say more about that in a bit. But I want to begin by talking about the two main theories that people have for the female orgasm that are adaptive in nature. Okay. So the first theory I want to talk about is called the pair bonding theory. Tell us what that is for those who might not know about it. In short, it is about emotional connection and the relationship to co-parenting. When you have an orgasm as a woman, the idea is that you connect with your male partner. And so the dude is less likely to leave you because the <laughs> sex was so good. And that means that they're less likely to leave you to raise the kids by yourself because seeing <laughs> the pleasure on your face in the moment of orgasm is itself a reward for the man. Wait, okay. You, I feel like you just said two different things. The seeing the woman's orgasm is pleasure for the man, but you also said the sexual pleasure that you give him, which made me think it was about his orgasm. Whose orgasm is it about? No, it's all, it's all the female orgasm. So when the woman has an orgasm while having sex with a man, 
the man will be so happy that <laughs> he sees her joyful jouissance face that he will bond emotionally with her. Oh my so the God. two will bond and that will create a pair bond that is much more likely to be uh, successful for rearing children. I feel like this is giving way too much credit to the idea that men gain happiness from women's orgasm, not to mention what we'll talk about <laughs> later, which is the orgasm gap. The fact that a lot of women don't tend to orgasm uh, during penetrative sex with men. Well, why don't we talk about it now, actually, since it's pretty relevant here? OK, yes, yeah, so I'll mention this because it sounds like it definitely is relevant to the Lloyd piece. So the orgasm gap is the very, very marked difference in the frequency of orgasm between cisgender men and women in heterosexual intercourse, mm -hmm. specifically penis and vagina intercourse. And this has been documented in research for decades. Uh, there's one study, for instance, that shows that in casual hookups, cisgender men tend to orgasm the majority of the time and cisgender women tend to not no. <laughs> orgasm the majority of the time, but even with long-term relationships, there's still a pretty strong orgasm gap between cisgender men and women. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Elizabeth Lloyd spends a lot of time talking about the orgasm gap because this is her main argument against the spare bonding hypothesis. The fact that women tend not to orgasm, so it just like throws a wrench into the theory. Mm. But more importantly, she also talks about the ways in which women do orgasm when they do. And yeah. that is primarily through masturbation. Yes. And so there is no connection at all, not just to sex with men, to cis men, or with uh, vaginal penetration by another person. It just, like, the guy is not even around. Yes. No, this is something that does not get talked about enough. There's this stereotype that, oh, people with vaginas find it very hard to orgasm. And it's like, with... with men yes <laughs> from vaginal <laughs> penetration alone yes exactly like masturbation does not have this issue and this gap in our knowledge is what the feminist philosopher nancy tuana calls an epistemology of ignorance around female desire drawing that term from the philosopher charles mills mm -hmm. so we might actually say that there are two orgasm gaps really there's the gap in who has the orgasms mm -hmm. and there's also a second gap in our knowledge about the what's known as the quote female orgasm so this is an epistemic gap which leads people not to know when women really orgasm yeah, and uh, so where Lloyd connects biology and feminist theory is precisely in her claim that men, especially male scientists working in this area, they think that women come from vaginal penetration in the context of reproduction. Yeah, yeah. And that is their bias. That is their ideology. She also talks about how orgasms for many women are quite rare. So there are a lot of women who don't experience orgasms very frequently. Yeah, in penetrative sex, as we were just well, talking about Well, there are some who actually experience fewer orgasms just generally. Yes. And so that's also a challenge to this view, not to mention the fact that there is absolutely no data, that's how she puts it, suggesting that men are less likely to leave you <laughs> if you orgasm and to stick around for like like taking care of the kid like there's just no data for that and it's so funny because i think you're rightly presenting this as the dream the fiction of predominantly male biologists <laughs> yes. but it also strikes me that this might be kind of like a cisgender woman's dream too like oh i get to have an orgasm and i also get to not be left high and dry <laughs> like cool win win and it's like it does, not, it does not work that way. Yeah, so this is the first main theory that Lloyd sort of demolishes. A second theory that is similar, but with some important differences, is the female choice theory of the female orgasm. Now, this is a very complicated theory, so I'm just going to hit through the main points and tell me if there is need for clarification on some. In short, a woman chooses her sexual partners. But she typically, for evolutionary reasons, will choose to have sex with multiple men mm -hmm. because it's more advantageous just to hedge your bets. And that means that inside of the woman's body, there is this race and competition among semen from different men that are competing to get to the egg. And the idea is that the woman must develop some kind of mechanism to help the good semen beat the bad oh my God. semen <laughs> in this uh, rat race that happens inside her body. And so when a woman is having sex with what is called a high quality male, 
she activates completely unconsciously a bodily mechanism called upsuck, <laughs> where, whereby her body sort of like shakes up and like sucks up like the good. Oh my god. Of the good guy. Oh my god. As a way of making sure that it will be more likely to leave the the poor quality semen in the dust. And so she will be <laughs> impregnated by by good sperm. Okay, so many questions here. Um like how are they defining a high quality male? Because I know a lot of people have been looking for one for years. Uh, oh my god, join the club. <laughs> um no, but the, the argument is that a high quality male the criteria for that is not even consciously accessible to the woman. So there will be something about a particular man that the woman's perceptual system will register as high quality without her knowing. So maybe it's like the symmetry of the face. Maybe it's size. You know, whatever it is, it triggers oh something God. in her body to be like, mm, give it to me. <laughs> okay, so, to we're, me. so we're supposed to believe that there's some sort of unconscious <laughs> eugenicist inside <laughs> the woman you know <laughs> killing the bad sperm wow um, well I, I don't know if you recall this but in the polyamory episode that we did a couple of years ago we talked about sex at dawn and this is a view that that book puts forth i don't remember the upsuck part in particular <laughs> but it does talk about like some sort of natural selection happening in terms of yes. different semen and i'm you know i'm not a biologist so i would not claim to know the veracity of that claim. However, it sounds like Lloyd thinks it's not legit. Is that right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And again, the argument that she returns to again and again is that all these scientists not only have difficulty explaining what that upsuck mechanism is and how <laughs> it, especially if you have sex with multiple men in a short period of time and all this semen is sort of there together, Yeah, how you would selectively upsuck good semen versus bad <laughs> semen. Um, but even if it happens over different days, for example, where you could differentiate, there's just no data to suggest that there is any effective causal connection between orgasm and reproductive success. Mm. Because it's not as if you're more likely to get pregnant when you orgasm, yeah. as opposed to the moments where you don't. There is just no data there. And so she says, let's not confuse what all these male scientists are confusing, which is sex that culminates in pregnancy versus sex that culminates in coming. And I think these two theories seem to have really different ideological implications to them. Because the first one, the pair bonding theory, is closely related to a vision of monogamous nuclear family life, where the woman and the man are like, oh, we're so happy together because not even because we both had an orgasm, but because the man watched the woman, the woman orgasm. Yes. And so it's like, now we'll stay together forever. And the amount of magical thinking you have to yes. have to think that over the course of nine months, they are going to stay the, together yes. and have sex <laughs> joyfully. And then over the course of the entire child's life, they're going to do that rather than the possibility that maybe she was like sleeping with a few different men at the time. And, you know, in this like world that existed way before we had our monogamous marriage norms, I, I think it's just like very strangely anachronistic. And a lot of the pair bonding research, I think, has been the target of critique lately because of its monogamous heterosexual implications. But then on the other side, this what can we call it upsuck theory? Yeah, the, some people call it the upsuck theory or okay. the female choice theory. OK, so so that has very different ideological implications, which is like a much more we might say lascivious, lascivious. <laughs> But we could say, like, open, you know, in a, in a more neutral way. It has, like, a more open approach of, like, hey, maybe this woman was having sex with many different men and there is some kind of choice that's going on there. I'm all for women's choice of male sexual partners <laughs> yes. and, you know, overthrowing ideologies of monogamy. At the same time, there's, like, a very bizarre undercurrent to this, which is that it's not just about natural selection. It's about some eugenic homunculus that lives inside the <laughs> vagina. <laughs> it's like, you're a good semen, you are a bad semen, and you shall not pass. It's, it's uh, like the Willy Wonka egg. <laughs> you know that egg weigher? Yes. yes. <laughs> good egg or bad egg. Oh my gosh. And but the, with semen instead of eggs? Yeah. And the you know, egg deciding. The egg deciding, <laughs> yes. Um, and the, the really dark side of this theory, and this is something that Lloyd talks about, is that in the end, this theory is rooted in 
turning the orgasm into the normative telos of all female sexuality. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. because it takes a normative aspect, it very quickly bleeds into psychiatry, where women who don't have sex that culminates in this kind of orgasmic reproduction mm -hmm. are somehow deemed yeah. biologically abnormal. And I think that helps us make a distinction between, on the one hand, the idea that orgasm has a particular relation to erotic pleasure as its telos, like mm -hmm. as its outcome. And on the other hand, wanting to hold open a lot of space for the idea that erotic pleasure need not have that outcome. Yes. yes. So it's more of an ontological versus like a pragmatic point. If you're enjoying Overthink, please consider supporting the podcast by joining our Patreon. We are an independent, self-supporting podcast. And as a subscriber, you can help us cover our key production costs, gain access to our exclusive digital library of bonus content, and more. So if none of these wild theories explain what Lloyd is calling female orgasm, what does? Even non-human primates like chimpanzees and gorillas have orgasms regardless of their sex and masturbate, let alone humans, right? So obviously this is a natural behavior. Yeah, so she ends up adopting, as I mentioned, what is called a non-adaptationist theory of the female orgasm. And she argues that it didn't evolve because it provided an adaptive benefit to our ancestors. Rather, it is a bit of an evolutionary accident or a bonus that women got basically for free. So she thinks that orgasms are adaptive in men. She thinks that orgasms are adaptive in men because there is a clearer link between orgasm and reproduction in men since it's tied to the ejaculation of semen, right? That's why you said it's harder for men to fake orgasms, mm -hmm. arguably. But the processes that are necessary to bring about orgasm in men have to do with early stages of fetal development before the fetus is sexed in the womb. And so basically, the fetus is made and it starts developing certain genital tissues. This is before week eight of a pregnancy. After week eight, there are hormones that push the fetus one way or the other. But before that, the fetus is neither. We cannot speak of the early fetus as either uh, male or female. And the anatomical structures that take place before this eight-week period those are precisely the ones that are tied to the orgasm in men. But because they're already there before the sexing of the fetus, they're going to be there no matter which hormonal trajectory the fetus takes. Hmm. And so it will be there in men and it will be there in women. OK, so this is really interesting because before eight weeks, that's also the time before sexual differentiation when I think a really, really stereotyped, overly simplistic way of putting it is that everybody is female? Uh, yes, everybody, so the, yes. So there's this kind of gender bending there, or we could say sex bending would, sex be, bending, would yes. be it, between the fact that folks are born with XX chromosomes, but then there's this adaptation that's for those people who are going to develop penises, but everybody gets it. Yes, everybody gets this it. This is cool. And so there are some things about Sorry if body. I messed up my biology slightly there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I think the point still stands, hopefully. No, the, <laughs> the point does stand. And so the, the big point that also should stand here is that for Lloyd, there is a lot of aspects of our body and of human life that exist simply because other things were selected for yeah. that they're costly connected to, even though they themselves don't have really much of a value. And the female orgasm is one of them because in the end, she has this whole theory that it has to do with certain anatomical distances in, in women's uh, genitals. We won't get into detail about that. But once you think about the female orgasm as an accident or as a non-adaptationist byproduct, she says it becomes the inverse of the male nipple. So People often ask, why do men have nipples since mm -hmm, they don't actually mm -hmm. yeah, need yeah, them? Yeah. And it's the same explanation. In women, there is this connection between nipples and reproduction and child rearing in biological theory. But what is required to produce them takes place before sexual differentiation in fetal development. And so men get nipples sort of for free. 
and women get orgasms sort of for free. The orgasm is a much better bonus than the nipple. Oh my gosh, no kidding. This is a really interesting idea and as is obvious, I'm no evolutionary biologist, but I wonder how it might speak to the orgasm gap. The majority of cisgender women do not experience orgasm during hookups, as we talked about, whereas the majority of men do. There are likely many reasons for this, and we're not fully sure of all of them, but they're not purely biological. Very unsurprisingly, culture has a lot to do with this. The book by Emily Nagoski called Come As You Are, which I think is a very, very popular book among women my age and and younger, cites some research saying that women who feel worse about their bodies have less satisfying sex with less pleasure and more pain. And so your body image can shape your sexual pleasure and your ability to orgasm. If you raise girls in a society in which they are taught to be ashamed of their desires and to put others' pleasure first, especially men's, it's no wonder that they would have trouble later on having orgasms. And sexual violation can also render pleasure difficult. We know that people of all genders experience sexual violation, but it is predominantly something that women experience. And so I think, you know, so many women are survivors of sexual violation. And so that goes into it, too. So we have these really important social factors that are shaping the difficulties that women have orgasming, especially with men. Well, and I like that you bring in this cultural and social dimension to orgasms because Lloyd is aware and she wants to prevent people from reading her work in this way that she seems to be reducing female orgasm to biology. And especially if you call it an accident or a bonus, somebody could say, oh, well, does this mean that female pleasure is derivative or trivial or less important Mm -hmm, than men's? mm -hmm. And she says, no, 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 no. The evolutionary biological account is one thing. The social significance of the traits that we have is a whole other thing. And so, yeah, from a biological perspective, the female orgasm is derivative of men, only in this very technical, anatomical, developmental way. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to have better understanding of the biases, the cultural biases that apply to the female orgasm and that produce the orgasm gap. The right to orgasm. The Nagoski book features an account of sexual desire that is called the dual control model. And Mm. I think I mentioned this book is popular among women my age. A lot of it is for this reason, because Nagoski articulates the fact that sexual arousal is not a single process, but actually two processes. The first is activating the accelerator, and the second is deactivating the brakes. So an accelerator is what moves you towards wanting this experience, right? That's a component of arousal. But there's also these brakes that can hit stop yes. at any moment. And she writes that sensitive brakes, regardless of the accelerator, is the strongest predictor of sexual problems of all kinds. So there's a stereotype mm. that women have a hard time getting turned on, right? This idea that they're frigid or cold or don't experience pleasure. They don't which, accelerate. Yeah, which like you <laughs> still see a lot on alt-right Twitter, mm. terrifyingly. But Nagoski shows that accelerator is not the problem for most women. It's actually the brakes. The idea that women have more inhibitions around sex than men do actually has some truth to it. But that's not biologically based. It's culturally and psychologically based. There are two different breaks, in fact. There are your internal fears, like maybe you're afraid of taking too long to get aroused, and so you can't really get aroused. And external factors, such as getting caught having sex, the fear of pregnancy, maybe fear of sexual violation. And one thing that hits the breaks that I find really important to highlight here is disgust. Because as Nagoski says, many women were raised in cultures that say that their own sexual bodies are disgusting and degrading, that, you know, vulvas are smelly, they're ugly, the sounds and smells that they create are gross. And disgust is a major break hitter. Yeah, and so it would seem like these breaks, by definition, what they do is they cut the flow of the experience and prevent not just the progress, but the kind of acceleration where you move and move faster and faster and faster towards this sort of telos, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. and it just draws you out of the experience. It's like a bucket of cold water for women. That's a very different kind of little death. (laughs) 
It's not the little death you want, which I think, David, might take us back to your point at the beginning, which is that you don't think that the idea of orgasm as little death is getting to the phenomenon in the sense of its intensification, right? You really wanted to highlight the intensification of experience that we feel during orgasm. Yes, and ideally the point is that everybody would get to that intense point without that socially produced and culturally produced gap. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can subscribe to our Patreon for exclusive access to bonus videos, live Q&As, and more. To reach out to us and find episode info, go to overthinkpodcast.com and connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at overthink underscore pod. We'd like to thank our audio editor, Aaron Morgan, our production assistant, Claire Ahern, and Samuel P.K. Smith for the original music. And to our listeners, thanks so much for overthinking with us.